It's uh, Benjamin Douglas Ray here with uh, Sustainable Cannabis TV. I'm here with Mark Musselman. How are you today? I'm great, Ben. How are you this morning? Doing excellent. Thanks for coming on the show and uh, spending some time. I know you've got a busy schedule, but it's a very important one. And I know you've got a lot of goals uh, in 2021 that we've talked about before. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you viewers that Mark is uh, he's a coach to CEOs, an executive business coach. And he's coached hundreds of CEOs. And the reason that Mark's successful is based on his personal experience of having a family-owned business, which you can talk about in a second here, Mark. But I want to give some context here. Mark and I, uh, we, we were both in Denver, Colorado, and we, we knew some similar people. And I realized uh, through, from going through a leadership group, I realized that Mark was a couple blocks away from me. And once we went through this group about three years ago, we, pay, we became good friends and we've you know, communicated ever since. And I'm, I'm honored and proud to, to have you as a friend, Mark, and I'm happy to have you on this show. And I would like you to give a little bit about your background, what you went through uh, with the family business and why that makes you successful now, and tell us really what you're working on uh, over this past year. And um, let's, we'll jump right into it. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, Thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be in this conversation. Yeah, as I think you probably expect, I don't know where it's going, but I trust that it's going somewhere constructive and positive. <laughs> um, and I'll start with this idea that you kind of mentioned briefly around the history and what has me being where I am today. And, you know, back in uh, 1999, I was part of a family owned business. It was a multi generational family owned business with a couple hundred employees, and it was a good business. Um, and I'm one of five children that my parents opted to have. And we went through a succession planning process uh, facilitated with some outside resources. And at the end of that process, you know, the baton was handed from my father, who he and his brother started the business, you know, in 1965 to me to run it. I was 30 years old and I really didn't have any idea how to run a business with, you know, a couple hundred employees and, you know, 15, 20 ish million dollars in revenue. And so, I reached out to a guy locally um, who I knew did work in this coaching realm, like helping people understand what leadership was and how to run a business. So that's where my journey began was really in that initial conversation when I was trying to figure out what to do as a leader of this organization. So I did that from basically 2000 all the way through 2007, eight, when my family's business went through bankruptcy which you know was obviously, as anybody can understand, a pretty intense and um, emotional process uh, filled mm -hmm. with all kinds of challenges. And it was on the end of that process when I found myself now having been the CEO of a business that went through this period where I had to kind of reinvent myself, which you know many people are doing right now. I mean, if you think about you know the application of this idea of reinvention like there's millions of people reinventing themselves right now because of the circumstances so in that process you know I, I realized that over the tenure that i had as the ceo i had been supported greatly by coaches um, i sustained a coach through that entire process because i was deeply committed to continuously learning and growing and being a more effective leader every year that i went from you know one year to the next and so I had this set of skills that um, had been really brought to me through my own journey. And so I figured, hey, I got to do something. You know, I no longer had this opportunity to run my family's business. So, you know, I did what a lot of people do is I took everything that I knew and I hung a shingle and I reached out to some people who were in my sphere. And I just said, hey, you know, I've been through something that I think might have value to you. And what I found is that oddly enough, at first I kind of shied away from talking about the bankruptcy because I held it as a place of embarrassment, mm. almost a place of shame. And then what I realized oddly enough and unexpectedly is that the more I talked about it specifically with entrepreneurs, you know, in any industry and CEOs or people who were leading an organization or a major division in an organization, I, I began to create in the conversation something which was honesty. And, and the reason it was honesty is because I wasn't hiding anything. And, you know, there's so many games that are played in that level of owner and leadership where people are, are basically they're pretending 
and you know they're trying to avoid looking bad and doing everything they can to look good and and when you show up as i did in those moments because it was my truth just saying hey here's the mess of what happened and i'm fine i'm actually recreating myself in this new capacity it brought barriers down and the barriers coming down created this connection for deep deep you know really authentic conversations and so then you know when that happens then you can actually create something you know well, I, so, I, I mean, so many of us uh in the in the world are going through that right now yeah. and you know i i know that you did uh consulting with ceos in the cannabis space you know when yeah. we came forward here uh, with rec in in colorado and the principles that you teach are not specifically for cannabis it's not specifically for a certain vertical but these work with any ceo entrepreneur leader is that correct in terms of these practices based on what you learned to help them um, sustain their business absolutely a hundred percent you know transferable across any particular industry and you're right i did have this really amazing opportunity when the rec game was actually it was the medical game that was being played initially and i had the good fortune of uh having a brother who was close friends with somebody who was part of this group of investors who started up a fantastic organization and in that cannabis section i mean i was drawn to it because what they were really working to do was create an alternative to opiate palliative care which i thought my, my goodness you know who who doesn't want that right and so i was inspired and touched and moved to be a part of that conversation on a strategic level um but yeah the the the, the conversation uh, you know crosses all industries and and really what you i'm always listening for is where is somebody stuck because i know how stuck i have been and so listening for where somebody's stuck and then just working at a really slow you know pace like paying close attention to that thing and then seeing what we can do to remove whatever barriers are in the way so that you go from being stuck to unstuck and when you're unstuck then you're back in the flow whatever that means you know, to you as an individual. So that's the idea. So when you talk about kind of alignment, you know, you and I've talked a lot about that. How do you find out, you know, what your barriers are so that you can get aligned with, first of all, yourself, and then with the, the corporate goals and, um, you know, being able then to just move forward with that alignment on, on all levels? Yeah, well, you know, we talked about this in the context of sustainability. And, you know, alignment is one of the core, I'll call it foundational components of sustainability for an organization. And what happens for most organizational owners or leaders is, you know, they have a hundred percent of the context in their brain. And so, you know, what can happen often is because I hold the context, I assume, you know, wrongly that other people automatically have it. Well, they don't. Right. You have to, you have to consistently create a context where you can, as an owner or an entrepreneur or a leader, share with everyone who needs to know where and how they fit into where the organization is going. And then you got to find a way to sustain it. So that's this idea of sustainable alignment. And then you've got to allow for course corrections. It's all part of a sort of, a, I'll call it a, a sustainable process of how do you operationalize the activities of a business, right? And it's the leader's responsibility, whether it's an individual leader as a CEO or president or a major divisional leader, to create that environment. And what I've noticed, not just in other organizations, but in my family's business, and then I've also had the chance, as you know, Ben, to step in and sort of play the role of CEO and president mm -hmm. of other businesses in, in Denver. And it's the same thing. It's universal across the board. It's the same thing in a family, right? I mean, if I'm not communicating clearly um, down and through with my children, you know, sort of values, visions, expectations, we can become misaligned as easily as you can in a business. So there's application across the board. So when you're talking about clear communication, I want to tie that to what you said a, a little bit ago about a need to know basis. So is it the responsibility of the CEO to determine who needs to know what or with clear communication, do you say, here's where we're going, here's where you fit in, and here's my vision for us? How do you reconcile those two? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I, I would say that it's individually specific. 
there's no one way to do any of this. And, you know, one of the things I would say as we're having this conversation is I don't hold anything that I would identify as truth, right? So I have a set of experiences that have indicated to me over time, both having run companies and having worked with many people who do run companies, that there are certain fundamental behaviors that tend to work more effectively than others. So open communication, I, I, I advise, I'm going to use that word, sort of advise CEOs or you know organizational leaders all the time. You can almost never over communicate, mm. but you can always under communicate. Oh, and right. the image of under communication oftentimes is devastating mm. because it, it, you know, what people do is they make stuff up, right? I mean, in the absence of clear communication, individuals are left to their own sort of imaginations and their own wonderings. And if left to their own imaginations and wonderings, most people, unfortunately, tend to make things up that are negative. Hmm. You know, it's that, it's that sort of chatter in your brain, that negative voice that tells us, unfortunately, gives us feedback that says, you know, you're not good enough, you're, you're going to be found out, you're the imposter, all that kind of crazy noise. Mm -hmm. Well, if a CEO or a leader doesn't communicate and communicate and communicate and keep people aligned to what's going on with the organization, then people are left to their own devices to make up what they want to make up. And more often than not, it's not going to be in exact alignment, which leads itself to other challenges. You know, that clear communication, I think, is an amazing skill that a lot of uh, leaders and CEOs need to work on. You know, there, there are so many brilliant people in the in the world, but they're poor communicators. And yeah. that's not an excuse not to talk about your vision and get alignment within the company. But I see that so many times, you know, working with different different organizations where the CEO would say, you know, I'm not a good communicator. I'm, I'm not that great. So then no one knows what the what the plans are. Right. Well, I mean, I, I'll speak to this uh, in a couple of different ways. One is as recently as the last couple of days, I had a conversation with uh, a person who's the uh, chief technology officer running a really large division. And this individual was really frustrated because somebody on that team wasn't doing what they wanted them to do. And I said, well, just tell me about what it is that you shared with them such that you created really clear expectations as to what needed to be done. And, and in that moment, it was like this, well, I, I really haven't done a very effective job. And I said, well, then what do you expect, right? I mean, this is the challenge is that that individual as the CTO had 100% of the context in their mind. Mm. And then the gap was not communicating that clearly so that another person whom they're holding accountable knows what it is that's expected. So. That's one thing. The other thing that I find, and I'm going to mention a book right now called Fierce Conversations. It was given to me in 2002 by one of my coaches, a guy named Don Myers, who is a Vistage chair and he's brilliant. And, you know, it is the most seminal book I've ever read because what are we doing all the time in every context of our lives is we're communicating, right? There's no relationship that we have that is absent communication. So this is a remarkable book to help develop some tools on how to be more effective at that skill. Um, her name is Susan Scott, she's the author. And I mention it because the other thing that she talks about as a primary tenant of her book is that the idea of fierce conversations is there's conversations that we know we need to be having as owners and leaders or you know, of our lives and of our organizations, and we avoid them. Mm. We step over them, we step around them, we pretend like they don't need to you know, be had and avoiding doesn't work. Right. It's, it's one of the you know, one of those principles that you can't, you can't hide. Right. From from. No. The, in fact, you know, the Tim Ferriss said the quality of your character is based on the amount of difficult conversations you're willing to have. Absolutely. And, you know, um, one of my sort of icons in, in just paying attention is uh, John Wooden. And, and John Wooden famously said, you know, not all conversations are good, but no conversations are almost always bad. <laughs> and I love that sort of sentiment, right? So one of the things that I've learned, I've had to learn because I was a total people pleaser. I avoided conflict as the CEO of my family's business only, you know, for the first probably five or six years. 
and, and believing that if I avoid it, it might go away. It just expands and it expands and becomes more intense. And then the more I avoid it, the more it grows. You know, who hasn't had that experience? And the more you want to avoid it. Of course, no question. I mean, you know, and as much as I know that I still get caught in that trap, you know, and sometimes it's like a friend who reaches out and there's that awkward period of time that I didn't return a call fast enough. And that's like, well, you know, now it almost looks like I'm avoiding them. And then, then, then it just grows. You know, it can happen so many different ways. But in the world of business, you know, it, it, and, then, and then it's that thing that that owner or leader or whoever goes home with every night and they wake up with every morning. At, you know, as if somehow going to bed or waking up is going to have it disappear and it just grows. Right. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's unavoidable. Yeah. You know, one, one thing that that I wanted to to tie into this was um, trust based culture and how the openness of the CEO and the rest of the culture can can really drive a, a business forward. So first talk about that kind of, you know, your your uh, theory on open trust based culture and then how that ties into the communication and the alignment for sustainable, for sustaining your business. Yeah, I mean, well, all of what we just talked about, this idea of alignment and this idea of open communication really presupposes that there's this thing called trust that is embedded as a cultural aspect of the business or the organization, whatever it is. Without that, none of that's gonna take place, hmm. you know, and it's really incumbent upon the leader to establish by demonstrating consistently that people can trust them and that the leader can trust the people, whatever that, you know, means. But I'll give you a great example. I have a client that I've been working with for only, only about like the last like five, seven years. And they have a conversation that's consistently rooted in the idea that there's trust. Yet when I get in the room and I facilitate the conversation with this group of people, what I notice, because I know some of the other conversations that are occurring, you know, I'll call them backdoor conversations. They're mm -hmm. not the ones that are being had in the room, they're ones being had outside the room, is that they fundamentally, as a leadership team, don't feel safe. They don't feel safe because there have been times when, you know, that particular leader violated the trust. And when you violate the trust, it creates an unsafe environment. And when people don't feel safe, they lock down. When they lock down, they don't communicate. And what does every leader need more than anything? Open flow of real information. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and all you have to do, I mean, this is not meant to be any conversation other than one of awareness, is turn on the television any day. And you'll see example after example of what happens when trust is violated. Mm -hmm. And you know, systems break down, organizations break down, families break down, friendships break down. And, and so the restoration of all of that or the sustainability of a healthy culture is rooted through trust. Um, people just want to feel safe mm -hmm. and you have to create it and then sustain it. And, and, and there is like no, there's like almost no room for falter. Mm -hmm. Because the minute you do it once, it's just people are not very forgiving. They'll hold on to that particular moment. And then you're held as a leader accountable to that moment. You may earn trust again, no different than in the inverse. If you're a leader and you have somebody who, you know, doesn't keep their word, that is a breach of trust. And you may, as a leader, find it hard to restore the trust. So trust is a very, very delicate thing. And once spoiled is really difficult to restore. So that's how I think um, guarded we should be as stewards of that particular um, characteristic. This, uh, this question from Kate here, um, we can never communicate enough, but some executives get stuck in analysis paralysis. So as entrepreneurs, how do you avoid that? That's her question. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, let's talk about different aspects of communication. One is clear and focused and direct, right? So you do have sometimes leaders who get sort of stuck in this idea of indecision, which is really what Kate's talking about is like, I want, I need more information. I'm not sort of sure in my decision-making process. So instead of making any decision, I perpetually, you know, gather information and, and, and that confuses people, you know, significantly. So it's not just communicating. There's also an aspect of quality 
when the communication is occurring that's also equally as important. You know, I've, I've seen that a lot, that indecision is a decision. You know? yeah. So, you know, and the longer you wait sometimes, you know, and I've seen that over and over, I need, I need more, I can't make a decision until this happens. That speed can cost you what, you know, a market, it can cost you a month, a year, maybe a missed opportunity, maybe a launch of a brand with a competitor. Right. That, that is so, so how would you recommend to, to get enough data to make a decision um, that is fast enough to not miss your mark, yet it's accurate enough uh, on the ability to move forward with it? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I would ask or I'd answer that question with a question for the decision maker, like what additional information that's not already present do you need in order to go from not deciding to deciding, hmm. right? And so sometimes what they'll do when they see that or they confront that question is it's like uh, nothing. Like I, I don't need any more information. Okay, great. How can I and others who are you know with you on this journey, whatever it is, assist you now that we know that you have all the information you need in making the decision? The, the, the worst answer that you could get when you ask that question would be, I don't know. Right. And, and, and so, so this is one of my favorite, one of my favorite aspects of that book I mentioned, Fierce Conversations. It's really Susan Scott's um, foundation for her coaching approach, because as the people who I work with would know, the very first thing I do when I show up in a coaching conversation is, you know, what's the most important conversation we need to be having today? And then sometimes I'll say, I don't know. And I said, well, what would it be if you did know? <laughs> right. So, I mean, and, and, and the key there is that I don't want to rescue somebody because if I rescue them, then it's, it goes back to this conversation you and I have had before. I, I don't want to carry somebody's bag or their pack up the mountain. Mm -hmm. right? I got my own pack right? And, and I'm busy trying to get up the mountain. You know, I want to make sure that, if you're going to come with me on that climb, that you have the resource, the agency to carry your own pack. And the way to ensure that is to give somebody the opportunity to try. Hmm. And I, so I had a conversation last night, actually really fascinating with my daughter, who's 20 years old. And, you know, I asked her how she's feeling. Um, she's been going through some things and she said, I'm not sure. I said, well, you know, OK, I got that. But if you were sure, what would it sound like? And she goes, Dad, I just told you I don't know. I said, well, I, I get you don't know, but if you were to know, what? Is, and then all of a sudden, you know, a couple prompts, she says, well, I feel this and I feel that. And I feel, well, yeah, tell me more about that. Mm -hmm. And now we're into a conversation, not me putting words into her head that are my words, but giving her full agency to identify, but sitting with it. Because most people don't like to sit with the rigor of a question like that. You know, they'd rather deflect it. Hmm. Right. So, I mean, I love the question that Kate asked, and I think that's how I would, uh, you know, advise. The, um, you know, you did a couple a post a couple days ago that really resonated with me here on LinkedIn. And it was the difference between having to do something and choosing to do that. And I know you and I talked about this about two months ago, and I found myself catching, uh, catching myself saying, I can't do something or I have to do something like, you know, play with the kids or whatever that is. And you helped me to see that that's really the wrong way to go about it, how to reframe that. And it refreshed my memory when I saw that post. And I'm thinking, this is such an important thing to talk about here with entrepreneurs, leaders, CEOs, whomever. It's such a very small difference, but it makes a huge difference in the way that you um, think about that. And Right. Well, I love it. And, and you know, so my favorite example of this is sorry it's one of the things of living in a in a hold one second then excuse me it's all right it's live so yeah sorry yeah no worries that was a <laughs> we have COVID happening somewhere and my son came back home so in this sort of best way of demonstrating this is i come across and you may even been part of this conversation people say all the time i have to go to work right and they tell their spouse or their parents or their kids whomever like, why are you working? Because I have to work. Well, no, you don't. And nobody has to work. And, and what happens if I say that over and over and over long enough, I begin to believe that I have to do this thing called work. And I lose power in 
the moments when I'm choosing to work. So one of the things that I just use as a sort of a metaphor in this sort of distinction is this idea of like, I love telling my kids that I choose to work and that I want to work. And here's why. Mm -hmm. So when I leave, they know that I'm excited to go do the thing that I love to do, which is work. Mm -hmm. There's value in work. And I want to instill that value in my kids instead of sort of the victim side of it. And I'm going to use owner victim as a a distinction for a moment where as an owner, I say, I choose to, I want to, I am as a victim. I have to, I should, I need to, Mm. you know, all those things. And there's just a different energy attached to it. And, and kids listen, you know, spouses listen. And I have to is like, if I could, if I really could, I'd stay home, but I can't because I have to go to work. No, that's not true. You just don't want the consequences of what not working looks like mm-hmm. right? as an example. And I do, I do love the outcome of when I work for myself, for my kids, for my community, for everybody, right? It just, it's a workable situation. Yeah, I think when you get in that, when you say, I have to, what that's doing is that's pitting two things you want to do against one another. And then you in the middle feel like I just can't win because I'm not able to do that. I can't. I have to do this. I can't win. I'm trying to satisfy everybody, yet I'm not winning here. Absolutely. And, you know, and, and then you talk about going all the way back to our conversation before about being stuck, being stuck in the story that I have to is a really difficult place to live. And you talk about sustainability, right? This whole conversation, I, I, you know, is around sustainability. Well, sustainability in my life, when I live into a story that says I have to, is this, this, I, I lose all my, you know, in, uh, my power. Yeah. I'm giving it over to a story instead of like, man, I love to work. I love, and if I don't love to work where I'm working, then what do I want to do about changing the circumstances? And that's a whole other conversation, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, I can see how that's super valuable, uh, whether it's your personal life or in the office, you know, say, yeah. say, I'm choosing to drive the company this direction because here's why, as opposed to we have to get this to market or our competition will beat us, you know, something like that. Yeah. You're, you're saying as a leader, here's why I'm choosing to do this. Here's why we're doing it. Then there can be debate in there, but there's there, it's very clear communication. It's clear direction of the the vision. I'm choosing to do this because, and then you can talk about that as a is a way better way to lead a company into alignment, into open trust based culture. You know, you're obviously going to have disagreements, which are healthy. You know, as yeah, absolutely we all know are necessary yeah. to have those, but at least then people know why you're doing something. And they can choose to follow you or not, but at least it's clear at that point. And, and I had a conversation just recently with, you know, this happens often in sales, right? Where an organization has sort of aspirations to achieve a certain financial sales target. And, you know, one of the things that this person I was talking to was saying is that, you know, I, I, I feel like I have to achieve this number. And I said, okay, you know, that's, that's one way, but weren't you in a process? There was a conversation that occurred at some point in time where a number was given to you or you were responsible for creating a number. And then, you know, you get to this point where you say, well, okay, I'll go create that number. And if you don't agree with it, if you're not in it all the way, then there's a point at that moment when you can choose out. But once you say yes, once you say I got it and I'm going to go create that result, whatever it is, I'm using sales right now as an example, then it's like, I want to show up and I want to remain completely committed to creating whatever it was that I said that I would create, right? It just works more effectively than, right. than going through the entire year saying, oh, somebody gave that to me and they gave that to me, or I felt forced to create it and I don't have any, cho- well, you could always leave. That's an example of when, if your choices don't align with what's expected, then you can make another choice, which is just to transition onto something else where it works. Right. So, you know, sustainability and workability are like pairs. Mm-hmm. They're, they're like, you know, they, they move like this. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things in the work that I do is I'm constantly looking for workability. And where there's a high degree of workability, there's likely a high degree of sustainability 
you know, and, and, and that's just more effective. It's great. I mean, these are these are all great points and, you know, it's tremendous value. And thank you for coming on the show and getting that out there. Um, how can people get a hold of you if they want to continue the conversation? Yeah, great question. Thanks for asking. You know, I have a website, which is um, www, which you'd expect, mx5, that's the letter M, the letter X, the number five, consulting.com. So that's my website. Um, I have an email address, is, which is mark, with a K, at mx5consulting.com. And, you know, my phone number uh, is 720-800-1111, which couldn't be an easier number to remember. Um, I was, you know, fortunate to get that from AT&T. So those are the easiest ways to reach me. Um, if you want to direct message me, I'm active in LinkedIn every day. I really participate very on a very limited basis in Facebook. Um, but direct message through LinkedIn would be fantastic. And uh, you can text message me on that phone number as well. I'm pretty responsive uh, to all those things. Super. Thanks. So it's uh, the beginning of the year. So what, when you're looking forward 12 months, what are you going to accomplish? What do you, what do you, what do you want to do this year? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, I, if, you know, if anybody's interested, I spent the entire month of December from December 1st, all the way through the 31st, putting together a D so, sort of a, a, a um, deconstructed process of asking a bunch of questions that helped me prepare a roadmap for 2021. Mm. And the way that I look at it is I examine sort of five areas of my life, which is physical, spiritual, financial, relational, and intellectual. And then I establish some high level objectives in, in the game that I play. It's called the impossible game. So, you know, I could go through and name an outcome in each of those five areas that are sort of seminal to me in my life. You know, I'll give you an example because I believe in transparency. Um, and that is, you know, in the physical realm, I was quite open about this. You know, I'm 54 years old. I was a very competitive athlete when I was younger and I've lost that competitive uh, shape. So I'm basically 280 pounds today. And my goal is to get down to between 220 and 230 by the end of 2021, sustainably and incrementally beginning with a quarter one goal and then i do four quarter sprints over the course of the year but my first quarter is set moving me towards that 2021 outcome and then there's a goal financially there's a goal spiritually there's a goal relationally and there's a goal intellectually and uh, i mean i don't it doesn't probably serve anybody to go into that length of time but um, if you're interested you can go on to my linkedin you could even do the whole thing it doesn't matter i mean the whole thing about the year transitioning is made up, right? I like it because I like the made upness of it. Yeah. But if you didn't do that, I mean, who's to say you can't do that on, you know, January 10th or January right. 27th? I mean, just if it works, go pick a time frame. As you know, Ben, because you've done this as well, I do what I broke down into 31 days over three days, 10 hours a day, because it's my preference. I like the concentrated nature of just shutting down my life and going through a series of deep questions and then sitting in the rigor of those questions and coming out at the end of three days with a roadmap. That's my preference. But I did recognizing that not many people are going to choose to do 30 hours in three days. I did break it down into a 31 day process. That's great. Great. Well, thanks for having you on the show. I've got one one more question here uh, for you that I'm going to put up. Okay. See this. Not everyone has the tools to communicate with their colleagues and staff. Having someone like yourself, Mark, is a wonderful start. Also recommend NLP, require my clients to get NLP certification. Helps with the commun communication skills for the specific person, people they're communicating with. Great information, Mark. Thank you for sharing. Very important points. And then uh, they, they say here, uh, employees, not clients. So Yeah. Well, and, and I appreciate that. So neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, is absolutely one of the most foundational um, tools to have in a toolbox of effective communication. I love the work. It is seminal to anybody who wants to become a master at communicating, no question. So thanks for that comment. Great. Well, thanks again. Have an amazing day and I look yeah, you forward too. to talking to you soon. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Great to see you. Have a good day.